Can you hear me? Good morning. Okay, how about now? Better? Okay. Well, I have a really quick video I'm going to play first. That's why you don't see me up there. And I think you'll like it. Kind of, I kind of set the mood for today's lesson. I gotta shut some mics off, I think. Okay. This is what I hope for, and the red. So basically, that was a that was a really old video from a long time ago, but I always liked it because it uh, someday that's going to happen. And uh, and my lesson, uh, I'm moving into a new uh, period where I'm going to. Ain't that cool? I got to change something. <laughs> called infinity. <laughs> so you saw that young man at the end. And uh, that's my hope and prayer that uh, as, we, as we lay seeds, and even if somebody doesn't accept the Lord, that one second after the rapture, they're going to drop to their knees. That's something that, uh, that's what I mainly get out of that one, besides the fact that, wouldn't that be awesome? We're all sitting in church, praising the Lord, and all of a sudden it happened. That would be just awesome. But hopefully there'll be nobody in the congregation left. <laughs> Let me see what shot. <laughs> okay, I lost my train of thought. Let me get it back. So anyways, uh, if you get the handouts, you'll see I, got, I wrote a little introduction there, kind of. Uh, and when I got to this part of Daniel, and I'm going to show the verses here in a second, I realized that uh, when, I, when I started reading Daniel 11, 39, and 40, that I realized that it was talking all about Gog and Magog. And at that point, I felt really, really led I, I feel by the Holy Spirit, to kind of shift gears a little bit and dig a little deeper into that period we better known as a time of Jacob's trouble. Basically, from this point in Daniel of 1139 until the end of the chapter, uh, chapter 12, is all about the time of Jacob's trouble, or better known as Daniel's 70th week, or as we would like to coin it, uh, the tribulation. And so, I'm going to... Stop my Daniel study at this point. We'll still see the rest of it in this study. And if you look at that, uh, that one uh, really neat events of the end times, that was actually made by Pastor Silcott. And uh, I thought it was a really good, we're going to kind of go through that, but just the period of time you see there where it says tribulation. We're not going to concentrate on uh, the rapture or the, uh, I did that video only kind of to symbolize but that just happened, and that's what we're going to teach from now on, is we're going to talk about what happens right after uh, the rapture, going into the tribulation. So, let 
And I realized I can't get that display up there. That's what I was trying to do, is get that display up there. But I realized that I can't get, uh, it's in a PDF, and I can't get it into a picture format. <laughs> so I'll just leave this here for now. And, uh, oh, wait a minute, I know another way, I think. So to kind of start off here, get some verses. We just read those last verses that, that we left off at, and you'll see, and, uh, and kind of explain why I decided to do this. Uh, Thus saith he, do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. Remember, we had left off our last lesson talking about the Antichrist, and that's pretty much what we're going to pick up in this study. But it'll probably be mostly next week uh, when we start in that part of it. So I thought today was kind of like a little introduction and what I'm kind of going for here and why I chose to do this. And this verse here is the one. Every time I read through it probably a hundred times, and every single time I thought of the same thing, Ezekiel 38. At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. That, is, uh, that sounds so much like the uh, uh, Ezekiel 38. And for a lot of years now, I've been wanting to try to do a study where I kind of incorporate all the different uh, prophecies about the tribulation into one timeline. And that's kind of like what you see there in that timeline. So we're going to kind of like look through that. And... Uh, and when we get to a certain section, like Ezekiel 38, we're going to study that portion of it and include verses from other, uh, other passages that support it. And so I'm not sure how long this will take, but uh, that's kind of like what I really feel led to do. So I hope uh, it's, uh, it's beneficial. And, it's, uh, and to kind of make it kind of fun, I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to incorporate a real-world event that is kind of showing us that this time is, uh, is approaching. And we got a good one this week. Uh, I'll just mention it now, uh, as a matter of fact, that uh, I don't know if you heard about uh, that uh, on the 10th, Syria, uh, they found out that uh, Iran is enriching uh, the, uh, their uh, uranium uh, up to weapons grade as we speak. Syria uh, and uh, uh, Israel got wind of that, and they've been transporting a lot of weapons into Syria uh, from Iran. Uh, using the airports there at Damascus. And uh, there's a prophecy in Isaiah 17, 1 through 4, and I'll just read it real quick. The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Ai are forsaken, they shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim and the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria. It shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. And in that day it shall come to pass, the glory of Jacob shall be made thin and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. Uh, this is a prophecy of a, a period that uh, has not happened yet. Damascus is probably the most continuously inhabited city uh, going all the way back to almost Noah. Uh, that's how long it's been there, and the uh, it has never been destroyed. So that prophecy has never for. But Syria is being used as like a stepping stone for a lot that's going on now. Uh, Israel is constantly uh, sending airstrikes into Syria uh, to stop Iran from building up weapons, because Iran is not afraid to say how much they want to take out and eliminate Israel. Well, just on the tenth this week. Uh, they got wind of some more uh, aircraft coming into the uh, Damascus airport uh, carrying weapons. And because uh, Israel is hearing all this about nuclear uh, uh, things uh, happening with uh, them, that uh, they decided to take out the runways in Syria. And the interesting part about it, and I got a picture, uh, the Times of Jerusalem actually... Uh, posted a, a, a thing that uh, Russia spoke about it and is condemning Israel for uh, what they did. 
uh, in destroying the runways at uh, Damascus Airport. I mean, they really, they took them out. They, they put potholes, like four of them in each runway, and took out the tower. And that happened on the 10th. So uh, the timing of this study is kind of interesting. Because <laughs> now Russia is actually making, uh, making uh, obvious concern about what Israel is doing. So uh, we don't know what the hook is, but uh, we'll be getting into that part of it here in the next two weeks, I would say. So I was actually going to save that to the end, but I thought I'd throw it in there now. Uh, so let's take a look here. Uh, and uh, what was just happened in that video is the, is the rapture happened. And uh, so I thought I'd just real quick go through a few of the verses talking about the rapture and why we believe it's pre-tribulational, pre-millennial. Uh, I am a firm believer in that. And over here in John 14, 3, this is one of my favorite passages. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And if you're looking at your little diagram there, that's that first blue line. You can see we go up to the clouds and Jesus comes down to the clouds. Real important to realize that at that point, uh, Jesus does not set foot on, the, on, on earth. So it's not the second coming. Uh, I love it how some of these uh, other people try to claim that the, uh, that the uh, rapture is either in the, at some place else during the tribulation. Because they say that the second coming is only one of those. And they're right. And the second coming is at the end of the tribulation. Because uh, at this point, Jesus is not coming down to earth. And there's lots of verses that support that. Same over in Acts 1.11. Uh, this is when Jesus w uh, went up to heaven. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So in like manner, he's going to come in a similar fashion to come get us. And of course, the classic one is over in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And then uh, just a couple other passages. I'll touch base on Revelation 3.10 through 13. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the world. Here Jesus is writing a letter to one of the seven churches. And he is basically stating here that I'm going to keep you from the hour of temptation, i.e. the uh, tribulation, to try them to dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit say unto the churches. And Revelation 4, 1 through 11, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, basically the this is, the, this is the classic passage that I see as uh, shows us in, in heaven prior to Jesus opening the first seal. And that's basically how we're going to proceed through this study. Is that uh, the first seal uh, will probably happen next week. We'll talk about the Antichrist. Then the second seal, I believe, is, is, uh, uh, is war. And that's talking about uh, Gog and Magog invasion. So that... Uh, so even though I kind of mentioned that thing about Russia today, I don't believe that'll actually happen. That war will actually start until they're into the tribulation and the Antichrist is already exposed. But here in 411, and this is the point where John is actually taken up to heaven uh, to receive this vision. After this I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven and the first which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither, and I will show you the things that must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat upon the throne was like a jasper and sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about his throne, and sight like unto an emerald. Again, a great passage. Uh, we'll get more into that when we talk more about uh, uh, the throne room, when we get into this breaking the seals. So like I said, this is kind of like an introduction of what uh, I, I kind of wanted to accomplish. So I named it the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Not that actual passage you find in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So a remnant of Israel will be saved out of the, the, this particular period of time. And you notice it says that there'll be nothing, uh, none is like it. So uh, a couple of verses on that point over in Ezekiel 7.6. And an end is come, and the end is come, to watch us for thee. Behold, it is come. The morning is come unto thee, all thou that dwellest in the land. The time is come, the day of trouble is near, and not the sounding again of the mountains. Now will I surely pour out my fury upon thee, and accomplish my anger upon thee. I will judge thee according to thy ways, and will recompense thee for all thine abominations. And mine eye shall not spare, neither my Will I have pity? I will recompense thee according to thy ways and thy lone abominations. <clears throat> they are in the midst of thee, and you shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. And going, jumping over to Amos 5, 18 through uh, 20. Those other references you can look up to, the ones I'm not going to read right at the moment. All right, your leisure. We'll get into them probably more as we get into this study. Woe unto you desire the day of the Lord, to which it is for you. The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. And if a man die, flee from a lion, and a bear meet him, or went into a house and leaned his hand on the wall, and a serpent bit him. I love that verse, because it uh, basically that uh, they think they're going to be able to outrun God. And basically, uh, that ain't going to happen. I think that, uh, that verse in Amos is kind of interesting. The other guy's trying to run away from trouble, and every place he goes, he meets trouble. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light, even very dark and no brightness in it? Zechariah, we'll be in Zechariah quite a bit uh, in this study. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and the half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residual of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So you can see there's a lot of verses that kind of talk about this time period. Malachi 4.1, For behold, a day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And Acts 2.20, get a little New, New Testament stuff here. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And Revelation 6, 17. And for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand it? So, so nothing will be like it. There'll be nothing you can't compare it to we're even World War II. Uh, it'll be worse than that. And just a couple of verses on the time of Jacob's trouble uh, mentioned in there. Genesis 32, 7. Then Jacob was af uh, greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and herds and the camels into two bands. Now, this is a period where, uh, this is when uh, Jacob was getting ready to, uh, to see his brother again, and he was concerned, so he divided his uh, wives up uh, to make sure that uh, not all of them would uh, be destroyed. If uh, uh, And so you can see here, though, that uh, Jacob is concerned about it, and it's, a, it's kind of an indication of a kind of a foretelling of what's going to happen to the Jewish nation, uh, ultimately, uh, in this time of tribulation. I love this passage in Ge uh, Genesis 32, 24 through 20 through 30. It kind of really spells it out. This was a weird incident that happened uh, where Jacob was actually having a wrestling match where a lot of different people have different ideas of who it was. An angel, it could have been uh, Jesus Christ himself. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, controversy over that. And maybe in the Genesis study, we'll look at it even closer. But uh, and Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his high, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. 
And he said, Thy name shall be no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore it is that thou doest ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Penal, for I have seen God's face to face, and my life is preserved. Uh, now Jacob believed there was God, uh, and it, uh, but it's kind of like a, a hint of what's going to happen to Jacob's descendants going into the tribulation. And the whole idea that uh, his, his hip was never healed. Uh, and also in Hosea 12, 2 through 4, the Lord hath also a controversy with Judah and would punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his doings will he recompense him. He took his brother by the heel in the womb and by his strength he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. See, there it says angel. Uh, and again, that's why there's a little bit of controversy over exactly who that was. But he did ask him for a blessing. And... Uh, I don't think angels give blessings. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. And then the other verse that's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble is the, is the one we already studied, uh, Daniel 9.27. We'll just reread that. And this particular verse actually covers this entire period also. Uh, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's where we start in this next upcoming study. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's the midpoint of the tribulation. And for the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. And that's basically when Jesus comes back at the end. So that one verse kind of covers the entire period. And the beauty about this verse is it's verified by Jesus in, 20, in Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Who shall read this, let him understand. And again, we'll be looking at that too. And just another verse here. Uh, so this is the period of time that, uh, that uh, uh, we call the great... Now I wanted to mention too that uh, uh, in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus here is mentioning this, but he's also mentioning the fact that uh, you'll see the abomination of desolation. That's the midpoint, and you will find people that try to say that, uh, that God's wrath is only the second half. I don't believe that at all. Uh, I believe the whole thing is God's wrath, because we're going to, as I, as I hope to show you in this uh, study, that uh, right at the beginning, the person that is opening the seals is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God, and so, and he's the one pouring out the wrath on the earth. So that, that's where some of the mid-trib and, and post-trib try to change the date of the rapture by using verses like this. So I guess I'd mention that real quick. But they do call the second half of the tribulation even worse than the first half. Uh, so they, Jesus called it the Great Tribulation, which would be the last three and a half years. So the beauty of this is going to take us into a lot of different places. It's going to take us into Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, uh, all three of the Synoptic Gospels, and most of Revelation. Uh, so I, uh, you guys want to take a look at that uh, particular outline. I thought we'd have some fun. And we'll start off today with who are the players. And I'm just going to read the highlighted portions and maybe they'll have somebody yell out who they think uh, uh, that's talking about. So first off, we'll go to Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That one's kind of easy. <laughs> that one we're talking about Satan. Now the next one, we're going to go to Daniel 7, 8. And we'll be getting into all those different verses as we as these different people come into the... Uh, so I just thought it'd be fun to kind of uh, try to uh, figure out from the verse who the person is. These next ones won't be as easy. 
I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, for whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Yep, exactly. Next one, Revelation 13, 11, and 12. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Any ideas? What was that? Yep, yep, false prophet. And here's another easy one. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Any guesses? Okay, this is the throne room. Uh, this is what John saw when he got up to the throne room. There was somebody sitting on the throne. Basically, God the Father. Now, we'll jump into uh, Revelation 5, 6 through 8. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials of, full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So who are we talking about there? Yep, Jesus. Now, Revelation 8, 2. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and, he, and to them were given seven trumpets. That was pretty easy, too. It's in, the, it's in the verse. Angels. This one might not be as easy. Revelation 11, 3. And I will give power unto my... Oh, no, it's right in the verse. Two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. That would be the two witnesses. And then we're going to Revelation 7, 1 through 4. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascend from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which was sealed, and they were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Basically, it's a group of people, the 144,000. I think it's important, too, when you read that whole chapter, it goes through and, it's, and it actually tells you that uh, 12,000 from each tribe of the tribe of Israel. People love to try to take that and say that, uh, that uh, believers... Uh, who accept Christ in the tribulation are going to get sealed also uh, based on this verse. And there's actually a denomination that used to it used to say this. And that's the Jehovah's Witness say that they were part of this 144,000. They stopped doing that since their congregation now is higher than 144,000. Uh, but uh, kind of interesting that uh, it it spells out exactly. And I think God did that on purpose to make sure you, everyone understood it. It's, that these are Jewish evangelists. Okay, last one. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. When we had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto them, every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a, a little season until their fellow servants also. 
and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Any guesses on that one? I'll give you a little hint. Most likely that guy in red in our little video that dropped to his knees would be one of them. Later on in the passage, that rest of that verse will, uh, it's the tribulation saints, those that get saved during the tribulation. So we took, uh, so we looked at three sets of judgments of Revelation. Uh, so what we're going to do going forward, Revelation will probably be the backdrop for most of it, except when we go into a, a tangent, like when we go into Ezekiel 38, and that'll be fairly, uh, it'll probably be, it won't be next week, but it'll probably be the week after we actually really dig into Ezekiel 38 uh, and incorporate a lot of this other stuff. But my plan is to actually go through all of the uh, Revelation seals, trumpets, bowls, uh, in a chronological order. Rather than doing Revelation like verse by verse, uh, I'm actually going to try to incorporate things in Revelation that come into play during those drug judgments. So that you can kind of see, and we'll be bouncing around all over Revelation, because a lot of the other chapters in Revelation actually happen earlier uh, in Revelation than, they, than their placement in the uh, book itself. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to try to see where they actually fit in the timeline. Like I believe that, uh, this is an example, uh, uh, seal number six, I believe that's the midpoint. Uh, so that's just one example. And that uh, the, uh, the trumpet and bowl judgments are all in the second half. We'll kind of look at that and we'll see. Maybe uh, you guys can come up with some other ideas too. And, uh, and just a couple other notes here. Uh, we'll be also getting into Matthew uh, 24 and 25. Mark 13, Luke 21, that's the Olivet Discourse, which is also Jesus talking about this period of time to show the events of the seven-year period. And when we get done, maybe continue in the Millennium Kingdom. If, uh, if we have time, uh, we'll see how things pro pro progress. Not sure how long it'll take, but sure to help us with uh, witnessing to others. Just a little personal note, I got saved in, uh, when I was 12, uh, and... I was fascinated with prophecy even then, and uh, that was in 1972. And I remember one of the first books I read because I was fascinated with Revelation. And it was really a joy to find out that when, uh, when I started studying Paul, uh, when he went to Thessalonica, uh, right after salvation, he started talking about the rapture in the day of the Lord. And so uh, I, think it's, I think it's an important attribute that it really gives people an idea of what to look forward to but that also uh, uh, helps us in our witnessing uh, to others that say, hey, you know, you want to try to avoid this and, uh, and, can, and can get a good handle on exactly what's going to happen if you don't uh, look to the Lord for a relationship. So I'm not really going to talk about the church age at all. I'm not going to uh, cover Revelation 1 through 3, uh, but... Uh, I really highly recommend it, and if uh, I put that little link there, if you're, if you're really curious about it, I did a study on it uh, oh, about a year ago, I guess, and uh, the first 10 videos is on, uh, on the first three chapters, so if you wanted to uh, go check those out if you're curious. So I was kind of more than wanted to just to concentrate on, on, on Jacob's period of time, the tribulation. Kind of as an extension off of Daniel. And again, this is all about, all really about the Jews, uh, as we I hope to show. So I mentioned that article, and let me bring that picture up. I remember where I put it. We got a couple of more minutes here. Okay, there it is. And this is the article. I don't know if you can read it from there, but I'll just read it. It's the Times of Israel. It says, the Russian lashes Israel as satellite images showed disabled Damascus airport after raid. 
It says, Moscow condemns vicious, prov provocative attacks, both runways and Syrian capital, hit three times. Israel has accused Iran of using civilian flights to transfer weapons to Hezbollah. Hezbollah. So that's just one example, and uh, this is the actual picture of the runway. And uh, if you look at uh, these little square uh, tri uh, rectangles, uh, those uh, squares, those are the three places during the, on each runway, and also down here on this runway. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Let me change it. Right here, uh, you can see where the, uh, uh, the Israeli Air Force actually bombed the runways, and that's and that's a big technique. I remember uh, in my, my time in the military, that was one of the first things you always did if you anticipated going to war, is you wanted to cut the supply lines, and uh, so that's what they're basically doing by taking out these runways. It'll probably take at, oh, at least three to six months to try to rebuild these runways. Uh, it's not an easy task because to, to, to land a large aircraft, to, 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 you ever saw them build a runway, it's really thick. <clears throat> it's not like a regular highway. And they also took out the tower, from what I understand. I'm not sure where the tower is on this picture. But it's also a military air base and a civilian airport. So it, it took out both sides. So it really limited their ability to use it as a, uh, as a starting off point for war. So I thought that would be kind of fun to, as a uh, side note, as we head into the study of these times. Can I answer any questions uh, at this point? Does it sound like it's going to be something enjoyable? Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm going to try to do that each time. It's just my notes and maybe uh, kind of turn it into a little bit of a worksheet. But hold on to that that uh, events of the end times. That won't change much. Not every verse I'm going to go through uh, is on there, but it gives you a, a basic idea. Amen. Amen. Well, what's the verses there talk about the fact that uh, uh, by the time uh, that we get to the midpoint, I think, of this, is there's going to be a lot of people. I mean, we see verses in there talk about that uh, they know who's doing it. Uh, you know, have the rocks fall on us because uh, to protect us from the lamb. You know, uh, so these people are going to be uh, yelling that out uh, so that uh, they realize that who is actually doing it. So, uh, so that's all I had for today, and so let's end with a prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, oh, praise you, Lord, and thank you so much for prophecy. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great tool, Lord, to help us to understand uh, your future plans, and it's such an exciting time, Lord. Uh, but I also uh, think about all those people that are going to be caught in arms way, that they could uh, seek your face, as you uh, point out in, your, in the scriptures, and it... Uh, they can, too, uh, have hope of a future uh, outside of this terrible time that's going to have to uh, come upon the earth. And we give you all the praise and thanks. And all the people said, Amen.